We've come now to two psalms, Psalm 8 and 80, which of course are absolutely fantastic psalms about the Son of Man and what his work will lead to. And we're going to see just how important these psalms were to our Lord Jesus Christ and to ourselves. <clears throat> so what were the two essential ingredients that we spoke about at the end of our last study? The divinely bestowed capacity given to our Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of his conception, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and what happened thereafter. And of course his enthusiastic willingness to obey his Father even to the death of the cross. And it was by these things, of course, that Christ would restore the dominion that had been lost by Adam in the garden uh, in Genesis chapters 1, 2 and 3. Of course, you know the story well. In chapter 3, the dominion given in chapter 1 of Genesis to Adam and Eve was lost by sin. And so we're going to see that the work of our Lord Jesus Christ was to restore that dominion. I'm going to start quite unusually. I'm going to make your minds work from the very outset of this study by taking you to Psalm 80. So if you wouldn't mind joining me in Psalm 80, we'll have a look at the what you might call the minor. It's not minor, of course, but it's the, 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 uh, the one that's only going to be considered briefly in our study. We'll come back and have a much closer look at Psalm 8. But Psalm 80 is a fascinating psalm. It's a psalm of Asaph. And it starts in this very interesting way. Verses 1 and 2. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Then it says this. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, Stir up thy strength and come and save us. Now, this is, of course, referring to the time when God brought Israel out of Egypt. We know that from verse 8 of this psalm. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the nations, the Canaanites, and planted it. So we know what it's about. It's about the time when God brought them out of Egypt. He brought them to Sinai, and there he organised the encampment of Israel into what you can see on the screen. That encampment, of course, was very well set out with a purpose. And we know that in the marching order of Israel, it was Judah who led off. They were the, they were the tribe that led the, the march of the nation, followed by Issachar and Zebulun and then Reuben. And of course, in between these uh, sides of their camp, there were the Levites who were also involved, carrying the parts of the tabernacle, etc. Then there was uh, Reuben, Simeon and Gad, followed by the Ark of the Covenant and the furniture of the tabernacle, carried by the Kohathites. Then came Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin, Dan, Asher, and Naphtali took up the rear as they marched through the wilderness. Now, did you notice what it said there in verse 2? It said, before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. But that's wrong. That's not the right way around. You see what's happened here? Over on this western side of the camp, you have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. So what has is, what is the Spirit done through the psalmist? Well, it's put Benjamin between Ephraim and Manasseh. Have you noticed that before? Well, why would that happen, do you think? Well, it happens because, you see, verse 17 says this. Psalm 80, verse 17 says this. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand. So what does Benjamin mean? The son of of the right hand yes so this is clearly a verse about Christ isn't it let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself it's clearly about the work of God in Christ who is the son of his right hand so who who would be closest do you think to the cherubim where the Shekinah glory of God shines brightly. Well, in the encampment of Israel, it was Manasseh. They were closest, weren't they? The tabernacle is here. They were directly behind the most holy place. They were the closest. So what does God do? He switches them around. He puts Benjamin closer to the tabernacle, to the glory, the Shekinah glory between the cherubim. Why would he do that? Well, there was no one ever closer to God than the Son of the right hand, our Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, when he read this psalm, he knew it spoke about his work among both Jew and Gentile. 
That's how Christ read this psalm. He knew he had a responsibility, firstly to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. Now, how did he know that? Well, we want to explore that. And it's very, very important that we see and understand. Because, you see, what we have here in Ephraim and Manasseh are two tribes, sons of Joseph, who represent certain things. Manasseh and Ephraim represent natural Israel in the case of Manasseh and spiritual Israel in the case of Ephraim. In other words, Jew and Gentile in the family of God. Now, how do we come by that? So where does all this come from in Psalm 80? Well, you need to come back with me to Genesis chapter 48. We've got to be very quick on this because we don't have a lot of time to spend on it, but I think you'll know the story pretty well. Genesis chapter 48, this is the time when, of course, Jacob is going to uh, perform his greatest act of faith, says Paul in Hebrews 11, 21. The greatest act of faith in the 147-year life of Jacob happened in the last week of his life. Okay? It's, it, it's when he blessed the two sons of Joseph. And when, he brought, when Joseph brought those two boys to Jacob, Jacob knew exactly what he was doing, and he gave a clue of this in that he, got, he, deliberately, he deliberately changed the order of birth. And he got Joseph a bit upset when he blessed Ephraim with his right hand and Manasseh with his left, as you well know. But he gave a clue well before that happened. If you have a look at Genesis chapter 48, verse 1 says, It came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Well, that's the order of their birth, isn't it? Manasseh and Ephraim. Then you read this in verse 5. When Jacob says to Joseph, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Grandpa, your memory is failing. Joseph might have said. Because that's not the order of their birth. But you see, Jacob is doing this by faith. He's putting the younger before the elder. You never did that, did you? I mean, we know from the case of Esau and Jacob, you never did that. But he does. And you see, there's a reason for it. And you know the story of what happens here, how that when you read in Genesis 48 and verse 13 that Joseph choreographs what's going to happen. Verse 13 says he took them both, Ephraim and his right hand. By the way, in verse 12... It actually says he brought them out from between his knees. Well, it doesn't mean they were little boys, because they were at least 21 and 20, respectively. You know, they were full-grown men by this stage. So he, he brings them, and he's got, the, he's got the older boy, it says, he brought Ephraim in his right hand, the younger one, to Israel's left hand, and the older boy, Manasseh, in his left hand, because he wants, he wants Manasseh to be at Jacob's right hand, see? So he's got Manasseh at the left to be in juxtaposition to Jacob's right hand, the hand of authority and power. And the younger boy Ephraim, he's got at his right, so he wants, he wants Ephraim the younger at the left of Jacob. And Jacob goes, and changes his hands over. And Joseph's very upset and says in verse 17, When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And he said, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And Jacob says, Leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Verse 19. His father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He, meaning Manasseh, he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. Now why would that be the case? Well, Read the words that follow. What does he say? And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. You see, that's a reference to the Abrahamic promise, isn't it? Of Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5. So you see, what we've got here, brothers and sisters and young people, is an allegory. It's a parable. Manasseh represents Israel living under law. They are God's firstborn nation. He said that to Pharaoh, didn't he? Exodus 4, 22. Let my son, my firstborn, go. They were his firstborn nation. Manasseh means causing to forget. Or forgetting. And sadly, that was the history of natural Israel. God's firstborn. All right? That was their history. Jeremiah 2, verse 32 says, My people have forgotten me days without number. But what about Ephraim? 
Well, Ephraim represents spiritual Israel. His name means double fruit. In other words, God's going to get fruit from the Jew and from the Gentile by faith in the Abrahamic promises, not by law. So you see, Ephraim comes to represent where you and I sit in the scheme of things amongst faithful Gentiles who are believers in the covenants made unto Abraham. So he's appointed the rightful firstborn by Jacob, a type of spiritual Israel, Abraham's multitudinous seed, and that's what Jacob tells us in in Genesis 48 verse 19. And that's why Christ said in the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 21 verse 43, says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, that is the Jews, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. In other words, spiritual Israel. The faithful nation, as it were, that came from Abraham. So that's why, you see, when you come to Psalm 80, that this psalm meant a lot to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a psalm of the Son of Man. And it told him a lot about the work that his father had for him to do amongst both Jew and Gentile. Now the Samaritans, of course, claimed descent from Ephraim and Manasseh, the tribes who had inherited their region of the land. And Christ, as the Good Shepherd, knew that his mission was to unite Jew and Gentile in the purpose of God. So guess what you've got, brothers and sisters? In John chapter 3, he sets about the task of converting Nicodemus, who's the type of those Jews living under law. Bound to the law of Moses. He's, it's a long job, isn't it? In the case of Nicodemus, it took him three and a half years. He sets about the task of converting him. And he got a few, didn't he? Joseph of Arimathea and a few others. He didn't get too many, but he got a few. He knew he had a responsibility in that regard. So John chapter 3 is all about that. It's about his work amongst Manasseh. You know, Jews living under law. But what about the next chapter? The next chapter is John chapter 4. And that's the chapter that deals with the conversion of the woman of Samaria. And you know what Christ called the Samaritans? Gentiles. Strangers. They might have claimed to have a connection with Israel. They might have claimed Jacob was their father. He said, no, no, no. You're Gentiles. And they had come from Gentile nations, hadn't they? And they represent you and me. That's why Jesus spent two days with the Samaritans. And on the scriptural principle of one day representing a thousand years, you know what that means? From that time to this, he would spend 2,000 years converting Gentiles. He's still at it. He has a responsibility amongst Jew and Gentile. Now, that's pretty tough, isn't it? But he understood that perfectly. He understood exactly what Psalm 80 was about, that this was his work amongst Jew and Gentile. In the family of God. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. So there's your context. John 3, conversion of Nicodemus, Jew. John 4, conversion of the Samaritans, Gentile. Got that? Well, that's all I'm going to say, really, about Psalm 80. We're going to have to focus now upon Psalm 8. But not before we do this, because both in Psalm 80 and Psalm 8, you have this term. Now, if you're still in Psalm 80, if you're not, just listen carefully. It says... Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. How would that be done? Well, we spoke about that, didn't we, in our previous study. This is about God visiting. Visiting his son in a very special way. Visiting him in his birth, in his preparation. Okay? Now, that's the language, of course, that's used in Psalm 8. So come back to Psalm 8. We'll have a look at this term, visit. In Psalm 8. And we'll get, our, we'll get our boundaries, our framework right as to what Psalm 8 is really all about. So Psalm 8 verse 4 is another occurrence of this phrase, the Son of Man, when it refers to Christ. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now the word man there is Enosh. The first word man in verse 4 is Enosh. And Enosh means weak, mortal man. So what is meek, mortal man? that thou art mindful of him. And then it goes on to say this, and the son of man that thou visitest him. Now this phrase, the son of man, is bener Adam. And we'll put it up on the screen in a minute. Bener Adam. So it's a different word that is used in the Hebrew. And it's a reference here to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the son of man whom thou visitest. And this word visit in the Hebrew, pankad, means to pay attention to, to observe, to attend to, to seek, to look about for. In other words, there's special attention being devoted. Its first occurrence is in Genesis 21 verse 1. Yahweh visited Sarah and Isaac was conceived. In Genesis 50 verse 24, Joseph assured his brethren that God would surely visit them. In the Hebrew, that word pekat is used twice. In Hebrew, that means emphasis. So the idea clearly in the use of this word is that God is giving special attention to his son to ensure that he has dominion over carnality. And that's what this phrase, the son of man, is all about. So what about Psalm 8? There's been a lot of discussion about Psalm 8, a lot of discussion about where the subscriptions and superscriptions are, and etc. But you know, if, if you've read Brother, uh, he was a brother at one point, Thirtle's work, if you've read Thirtle's work about the Psalms, you'll know that he gives a pretty good proof from Habakkuk chapter 3. And that in fact, when you read Psalm 8, you see those words above verse 1, to the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David. Well, the words there, to the chief musician upon Gittith, belong to Psalm 7. They're the subscription. They come at the end, like a little musical notation. They come at the end of Psalm 7. Then, the words of Psalm of David are the superscription of Psalm 8. And the same thing applies when you come to Psalm 9. You see Psalm 9 has got the words there above verse 1. To the chief musician upon Muth Labin. They actually belong to Psalm 8. They are a subscription to Psalm 8. So when you look at that, this is actually telling you what Psalm 8 is about. It was written at the time of the death of Goliath. Because when it says to the chief musician upon Muth Labin, Muth Labin means on the death of the champion. Alright, on the death of the champion, the, the, the Philistine champion. Goliath. So David wrote this psalm after he had slain Goliath and brought Goliath's head to Jerusalem. Now, have you ever wondered why a, 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 a youth, probably 18, 19, they're about, have you ever wondered why a youth would want to carry a grisly, huge, heavy head? I mean, Goliath had rocks in his head, didn't he, really? So you, you imagine, you imagine the weight of this thing carrying it for 20 miles. You know, with ugly, greasy hair. Why would you carry this thing up and put it outside a city that Israel didn't even own? The city of Jebus. It wasn't in Israel's hands. Why would you do that? <coughs> Only because David understood that that's where Christ would be crucified. He put it in a place that became known as Golgotha. The skull of Goliath. Where Christ was going to be crucified. He knew where he'd be crucified. You know how he knew that? He knew it from Genesis 22. When Abraham was told by God to take his only son, whom he loved, Isaac, to a place in the land of Moriah, to one of the hills that God would show him. I guess what, what hill that was? The same hill on which Christ would be crucified. David knew that. So he went there and he put this skull he saw the death of Goliath as a type of the death of Christ. The putting to death of all that belongs to human nature. That shows a marvellous mind, doesn't it? In a, in a very young man. So, there are several allusions in 1 Samuel 17 that we're going to find are brought up here in Psalm 8. Because, of course, 1 Samuel 17 is the record about the death of Goliath. And it tells us exactly what David did at that time. But before we get into that, I want to show you something very special about Psalm 8. Psalm 8 begins and ends with the same words. Precisely the same words. And there's a reason for that. It says, O Lord our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And that's again repeated in verse 9, isn't it? It's exactly the same words. Now the word Lord here, you see that word Lord in the lower case? So you've got, O Yahweh, our Lord. That word Lord in the lower case is Adon. However, when you look at the Hebrew text, it's not just simply Adon. It has a suffix. In the Hebrew text, it is Adoninu. Now, Adon in the Hebrew is a singular word. means a ruler. 
But when you put a suffix on the end of it like this, Adoninu, it becomes first person plural. It changes it into a plural term. It indicates rulers and refers to Christ and the saints, manifesting the rulership of God in all the earth. So that's a very important fact. So the psalm begins and ends with the same word. So a literal translation of the opening and closing phrase of Psalm Psalm 8 would read this way. I'm spelling it out because we know that the name Yahweh means he who will become. So let's spell it out. O he who will become rulers, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. Would anybody suggest that God's name is majestic in the earth today? Is his name excellent in the earth today? No, it's despised by many, isn't it? It's, he's ignored by most. God's name is not excellent in the earth today. It might be to you and me, I understand the truth, but we're a very small minority. This is about another time, brothers and sisters. This psalm is about the kingdom of God. This is about the millennial rule of Christ. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know it because it's quoted in two places in the New Testament. It's quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 28. And both of those contexts are pretty well known to us. Might we just have a quick look at those, just briefly, just pop something into Psalm 8, because we're going to be back here shortly. Have a quick look at Hebrews chapter 2. I want to show you the context so that we know, without any question, what time Psalm 8 is going to be fulfilled. It's actually a kingdom psalm. So let's have a look firstly at Hebrews 2. And it's going to tell us something about this. In Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 5. And it says this, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now the word world there is oikomene in the Greek, and there are quite a number of Greek words rendered world in the English, in the King James. It's oikomene. It means the inhabited world. He says, For the ang- unto the angels hath God not put in subjection the inhabited world to come whereof we speak. So how would you prove? How would you prove that the angels are not going to be put in sub- that the, the world's not going to be put in subjection to the angels? The angels are not going to be ruling in the kingdom age. Well, quote Psalm 8. That's how he proves it. Because he, he then quotes Psalm 8 in verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? I won't read all of that because right down to verse the first sentence of verse 8, that's all from Psalm 8. It's all quoted from Psalm 8. So why would Paul quote that? Well, because Paul knows. He knows that Psalm 8 is a kingdom psalm. It's about the time when Christ and the saints will be ruling for a thousand years on the earth. It's the time when God's name will be excellent. It will be majestic because of education and instruction in divine ways that the saints will undertake under Christ's rule. Yeah, so that's why it'll be a great time. So you see, it's definitely kingdom. What about 1 Corinthians 15? Let's come back to 1 Corinthians 15 and we read how Paul again quotes this passage from Psalm 8. You see, what we're doing here, brothers and sisters, is what we should all do. We shouldn't be giving our opinions as to what we think something means, okay? You hear my opinions, please walk out. I invite you to walk out. You will not hear my opinions. Because my opinion is worth about as much as yours. Sorry, but it's not worth very much. What is absolutely critical is to allow the Bible to interpret itself. And it does. It speaks eloquently for itself. We do not need to add anything to it. So if the Bible's not speaking, well then you shouldn't be speaking. It's as simple as that. And this is what Paul is doing. Paul is giving us an interpretation of Psalm 8. He's telling us what it means. So when you come to verses 24 to 28, it says, Then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority. Now this is the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. So what was happening in that time? Well, Psalm 8 was being fulfilled. Because you then read this, verse 27. He says, For he hath put all things under his feet. Guess where it's from? Psalm 8, verse 6. Direct quotation from Psalm 8, verse 6. 
And you come down, of course, that's repeated again. The ideas are repeated in verse 28. So there's no doubt at all that Paul is saying that Psalm 8 is a kingdom psalm, a millennium psalm. A psalm that will only be fulfilled when Christ and the saints rule together over the earth. Now come back to Psalm 8, because there's something else that happens here, which gives additional proof that this is a kingdom psalm. So back in Psalm 8, I'm going to read verse 2. And it says this. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings that hast thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now some of you will have probably heard me say this before, but that word still in the King James Version is the word sabbath or Sabbath. It's the word for Sabbath, or one of the words for Sabbath in the Old Testament. It's this one here, Shabbat. To sit down, to rest, to be still. There are 70 occurrences rendered cease, rest, or keep Sabbath. In other words, when you read this, this is what it's saying. Because this is a kingdom psalm, and because this is the seventh millennium, it's the seventh day, it's the Sabbath day, it's the Sabbath that the people of God are going to keep, that Paul talks about in Hebrews 4. Because it's that day, he says, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest Sabbath the enemy and the avenger. So what's the enemy? Well, I know what my enemy is. Sin. And what's the avenger? Death. Yeah. Sin and death. They're going to be quieted for a while. We're going to be eliminated from your life and mine. And our job will be to try and eliminate it from everybody else's lives in the kingdom. To educate, to instruct so that people will faithfully serve out their time in the kingdom age and be raised at the second resurrection and judgment and end up where you and I will be. Immortal beings in the kingdom. Sabbath. Got the picture? That's what this psalm is about. There is your internal proof that this is a kingdom psalm. It could only be fulfilled there. Now this word Sabbath, of course, dominates the Old Testament in many ways. It's 111 occurrences of Shabbat, rendered Sabbath 110 times and another once. Shabbathon, 11 occurrences, uh, rendered variously. When you put all of those together, all right, it's a lot of, of occurrences. But then you come to the New Testament. In the New Testament, you've got Sabbatismos, Sabbaton, Sabbata, Pro-Sabbaton. Seventy occurrences, by the way, in the Greek. And seventy just happens to be the number of the nations. Okay? Pointing to the time when the nations are going to be in the kingdom and incorporated finally into one nation, the nation of Israel. Got a picture? That's marvellous. It's absolutely marvellous psalm. So when Christ read this, it meant a lot to him, brothers and sisters. And he practiced it while he was in his ministry. And I want to show you that. But just have a focus with me again on Psalm 8 verse 4. What is Enosh, weak mortal man, masculine singular by the way, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, Bena Adam, that thou visitest him. Now we understand what visitation means, because this is the title of Christ. This is the, this is the words in the Hebrew, Ben, which means a family builder, Right, a family builder of Adam. Unfortunately, the first Adam messed up big time, didn't he? So this is the last Adam. This is the one who's going to restore what the first Adam lost. This title is not so much about his humanity. It's about his exercising of dominion over the problems of humanity. It's about his restoration of the dominion Adam lost. So while the term is used in the Old Testament generally of mortal man in his weakness and frailty three times we know it's specifically used of Christ not as a weak mortal man but as the one sent by God to restore what was lost in the garden. And we're going to see that when we come to have a look at the way that this unfolds. So there in the context of Psalm 8 verse 4, Psalm 80 verse 17 where the same phrase is used and in Daniel 7.13 where we are told that one like unto the Son of Man these three references clearly refer to Christ and they are the, the roots of this phrase are back in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 28 when God said to Adam and Eve through the angels let them have dominion it was lost and he is the one who is restoring it. 
Now, son of man, without the article, is used 92 times in the book of Ezekiel. Now, I mean, again, I mean, there's, only, there's only 48 chapters, and 92 times in 48 chapters, Ezekiel's called son of man. He's not called the son of man, because you see, he's simply a shadow. He's not the reality, he's simply a type. So what's the subject of the book of Ezekiel about? Well, it's all about God exercising dominion. Chapter 1, cherubim. At the end of chapter 1, a throne with Christ sitting upon it, with a rainbow, peace on earth. And then the whole book is about God overthrowing the power of men. Son of man, set thy face against Gog. What's that about? Christ overthrowing the Gogian confederacy. Yeah, the whole thing is about exercising divine dominion in the earth. That's why Ezekiel, as a type of Christ, is called Son of Man. It's not about his mortality, his connection with human beings. It's about him being the one who would restore divine authority in the earth. Now you want proof of that, don't you? Some of you have had this proof before, so I don't need to give it to you, but I'm going to give it to those who haven't had it before. We need to have proof that this is true. So I'm going to take you to some New Testament, just a couple New Testament references. I want you to come, first of all, to Matthew chapter 9. Now you can check me out on this. I, I, I offer this challenge to anyone, and I know that it will come out the right way because I've done it many times. <laughs> I offer the challenge. Find me one reference in the New Testament. There are 89 occurrences of the phrase, the Son of Man. And 85 of those are in the Gospel accounts. So you've got four Gospel accounts. 85 of them appear in the Gospel accounts. Find me one where the emphasis is on Christ's humanity. That is his connection with men. And therefore the things that belong to men. Weakness or frailty. Find me one. They don't exist. All right? They're all about him exercising divine authority. Delegated to him by God. To overpower things that belong to mortality. To overcome the problem of sin and death. That's what it's about. This is the man who would restore the dominion lost by Adam. So, you're in Matthew chapter 9? Well, I'm not. So just give me half a tick and I'll be there with you. We're going to have a look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 5 to 8. And we'll see, this is the story, of course, about a man with a real problem. The, the palsy man of verse 2, who, who can't move. And so, here's Christ, he's in a house, he's jammed in a house. They can't get this fellow in, they're carrying his, you know, this fellow on, on, a, on a bed. They can't get him in, so they go up on the roof. Which is quite a job anyway, they get a guy up the stairs up to the roof. And they pull up the roof, they pull up the, the stuff on the roof. You imagine all the stuff coming down. And they lowered this guy down at the feet of Christ. Faith! I mean, they are determined. They are really determined to help their poor friend. And then Jesus does something quite remarkable. Read the record with me at Matthew 9, verse 5. Now, we'll come back a bit. We'll come back to verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. They didn't bring him to have his sins forgiven. Didn't they? They brought him to be cured of palsy. So he's, done, he's doing something very important. You see, mankind has got two big problems. One's a moral problem, sin. The other one's the consequence of sin, death. That's a physical problem. We've got a nature that's going to die. So sin, moral problem, death, physical problem. And so Christ addresses them in the right order. You are never, ever going to be free from the problem of your nature until your, your sins are forgiven. You need a moral cure before you get a physical one. They come in that order. All right. So sin's got to be forgiven first. So he says, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And they're all horrified. Well, who can forgive sins but God only? That's their reaction. Let's read on. Verse 4. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. 
But that, this is the important verse. But that ye may know... Now, what, what would you have used for a title? If you were Jesus Christ, what would you have used for a title? Well, I think I would have used... That ye may know that the Son of God hath power on earth. No. He says... That ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth. The word power there is exousia. It means delegated authority. That the Son of Man has delegated authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house. In other words, you get the right order. You need a moral cure first before you get the physical. And so he's teaching them something. He's teaching you and me something. But he's also teaching them this, us this. And that is that this title, which he draws from Psalm 8, verse 4, and from Psalm 80, verse 17, this title is not so much about his connection with humanity, although he was one of us. It's about him overcoming what we can't overcome and using God's power to restore the dominion that was lost in the garden by Adam and Eve. That's what it's about. One more different kind. I mean, you can go, look, there's 85, so there's no, there's no shortage of these. You can go through all of those, you'll find the same message. Come with me to John chapter 5, and let's just see another aspect of this. Now again, this comes hard on the back of a, a wonderful miracle, the, the third sign of John's gospel, the man at the pool of Bethesda. We're not going to go into all of that, we're just going to pick this up at verses 25 and 27. 25 to 27 of John chapter 5. Because he comes down, to, of course, to the resurrection, to the judgment seat. In verse 25, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Notice that title. The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. Yes. And they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given, hath he given life to the Son to have life in himself. Then look at verse 27. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So what's your context? Your context is the Son of God converting people by his words, sending his angels to raise them from the dead, and judging them. So what's he called as the judge? The Son of Man. Why? Because he's got the delegated authority from God to ex exercise authority and dominion over carnal things. That's why. So it's pr pretty clear when you examine this what that phrase really means. So what about when you put the Sabbath and the Son of Man together? Well, the Sabbath prefigures the millennium during which divine dominion will be exercised in the earth. The Son of Man, a title of Christ, who's, the, who's called by Paul the last Adam is all about his delegated authority to exercise dominion over all carnal things on earth. And he deliberately taught, brothers and sisters and young people, he deliberately taught on the Sabbath day and healed on the Sabbath day to the chagrin of the Jews. They said, why can't you come along on six days? Don't come on the Sabbath. And, and the indignation of the priests and, and, and the leaders of the synagogue, don't come on the Sabbath. And he said, I am healing on the Sabbath. He insisted on it. Why? Well, because it pointed to the millennium. It pointed to what he would do in the millennium, didn't it? The Sabbath represented in type the millennial age. He was getting ready for the work of the millennium. There are seven Sabbaths on which Christ healed in the Gospels. you know that? Seven Sabbaths are recorded that he healed. I don't think that's accidental either, because it too is pointing to greater things to come. So when you come back to Psalm 8, you've got a bit of a feel for what this psalm is about. Again, look, we could have spent several hours on it and not exhaust it, but we've got the key elements of Psalm 8. We want to have a look at one more thing here. It's this word that you read in verse 6 of the psalm. So in Psalm 8 and at verse 6, <coughs> we read this. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. This word dominion, mashal, means to rule. And you can see it's used variously in the Old Testament. It's based upon Genesis 1, 26 and 28. 
But in actual fact, a different word is used back in Genesis chapter 1. The word used in Genesis 1, 26 and 28 is radar, which means to tread down or to subjugate. The word used in Psalm 8 verse 6 is mashal. Why? Well, mashal speaks of the end attained. Radar speaks of the process. You see, the process is the treading down, the subjugation. And that leads to rulership. So the last Adam will share this dominion with his bride on the seventh day. Which is why, brothers and sisters, it's very important to recognise this simple fact. That when the angels had completed six days of the work of creation, they rested. Adam and Eve did not rest on the seventh day. The angels gave to them the dominion over all things. Adam and Eve, as it were, laboured. They worked on the seventh day. And they had to, you know why? Because it was a type of the kingdom age when Christ and the saints are going to work during a Sabbath period of a thousand years. It was a type of great things to come. It's a fulfilment of Psalm 8, isn't it? Oh, he who will become rulers, how excellent is thy name. That's going to happen during the thousand year reign of Christ. So I'm not going to go into all the details of 1 Samuel 17, but you know, David exercised dominion over the beasts of the earth by divine power. He said in 1 Samuel 13, a bear and a lion came out and I destroyed them by divine power. His mind was taken back to Genesis 1.26 by Goliath who said, I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the fowls of the air. Remember that? So David turns it back on him and then writes Psalm 8 when he's killed him. And what does he say here? Verse 7. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea, he's quoting. He's quoting from the words of Goliath and his reply to Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. He's, he had an amazing understanding of Genesis 3.15 and Genesis 22. And that scene when he carries the head of Goliath up to Golgotha. So let's conclude on this, in this uh, series, uh, in this particular uh, talk in Luke chapter 10. So come along to Luke chapter 10 with me. This series of Psalms 8 and 80. And we'll see what Luke 10 has to tell us about Psalm 8. Firstly, we notice the context of Luke 10. In verse 9 and again in verse 11, there's reference to the kingdom. The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, the disciples were to preach. In other words, this is about the kingdom of God. And they were preaching that. In verses 17 to 20, you have six titles for sin. Now, I'll take you through those in a minute. I'll step you through them and its effects. Compare Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 4 and 7, you read six. He had... He was, uh, he had um, a, 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 a piece of armour that was six something in weight and he was what? Six cubits in a span? So six is stamped all over Goliath. So six is the number of man isn't it? It's a very appropriate number. So look, look at these titles for sin and its effects here in verses 17 to 20. Verse 17 says, and the 70, that's interesting isn't it? 70, the number of the nations returned again with joy saying Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. So there's the first one. Demons or devils. Verse 18. He said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning. For There's the second one. Satan. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. We're up to four. And over all the power of the enemy. We're up to five. And, all, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits, so this word spirits is like a you know, it's a summary of them all, isn't it? We're up to six. There are six titles for sin and its effects, which the, the disciples were healing. They were going out and curing this disease and that sickness and this disease. And they come back, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through the power you've given. We've had this delegated authority to exercise dominion over carnal things. He said, don't rejoice in that. Huh? You're kidding me. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's what he says to them. Look at verse 20. At the end of the verse. But rather rejoice because your names 
are written in heaven. What does he mean? Well, he means, brothers and sisters, if their names are in the book of life, they're going to be there in the millennial age to cure all human sickness and disease. What they were doing then was nothing, was temporary, wasn't it? It was a temporary thing. You could cure someone of palsy, he's still going to die. What he really needs is a proper cure. And you, he says, are going to be in the kingdom and you're going to bring a proper cure, permanent cure, to people. Rejoice in the fact that your names are written in heaven. So what do you reckon he was going to then say? Verse 21. We read this. In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things. Where are these phrases coming from, do you think? Well, they're coming from Psalm 8. Look at the phrase there when he says, Lord of heaven and earth. You know how Psalm 8 begins? It's talking about God. His glory is excellent in all the earth. Yeah, heavens and earth belong to him. Look at the phrase he says there. That thou hast revealed them unto babes. Babes? That's Psalm 8 verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast hast ordained strength. Look at the phrase in verse 22. All things. That's straight from Psalm 8 verse 6. But there's something else here, brothers and sisters. He uses the term Father five times. Because that's where the strength comes from. So when David went out against Goliath, what did he do? He went down to the brook and he picked up Five smooth stones washed by the water of the word and smoothed. And one of them kills the diabolos in the brain of Goliath. Right? That's where it's going to come from. It's going to come from God. This victory over sin. So Paul can pick this up. He picks it up. Now we, we went through... 1 Corinthians 15 very briefly. Do you know how many times the word all appears here in the Greek and in the English? It's pretty accurate, very accurate. Ten. Ten times. And do you know how many times the word hupo, the ones in green there? You won't get this from the English text. Hupo, which is rendered under, occurs eight times in the passage, twice by itself and six times as part of the word hupo tasso. Eight just happens to be the biblical number of a new beginning that leads to immortality. And ten is the number for all. Hence, the millennial age is going to see God's dominion restored by Christ and the saints have dominion over all things leading to the immortality of every being on earth. When God will be all in all. That's what Psalm 8's about. What a marvellous psalm that was. Just imagine what that meant to Christ and what it means to us. Yeah, we're going to be there, brothers and sisters, hopefully, to perform that work as the bride of Christ who shared, just like Eve, who will share with him dominion over all things, but not to be disturbed by sin and death anymore. It will lead to the eradication of sin and death.